My name is Henry Thompson, and I was a former detective for my police department. I've been a detective for about seven years, and throughout my time working at the agency, I have many disturbing stories about the cases me and my partner solved. I've spent countless sleepless nights on these bizarre cases. I've cracked a lot of disturbing cases that the faint of heart could never solve. But I had my limits, or so I thought. My very first case almost made me quit the agency. Ever since I was young, I always knew I wanted to be a detective. Seeing all the TV shows of detectives solving cases always inspired me in some way. My father was a former detective of our city's police department. He was a well-respected detective, and he was even awarded key to the city by our mayor. But when there's good, there's always bad. With my father being a detective, he was hardly ever home, so I barely saw him. And even if he was home, he would be knocked out on the couch with his detective papers scattered across the living room table. The problems only got worse once I got into the academy. Since I joined the academy, I was always a mere shadow of my father. No matter what I did, I could never become my own person. No matter how hard I tried, I was always a shadow of my father. A part of me actually resented him for it, even though it wasn't his fault. I worked my ass off during that time in the academy. I was never handed anything during my time at the academy. If anything, they always pushed me harder because of my father and his legacy. I used the frustration I had built up inside of me as motivation. The lack of his presence and seeing my mother basically raise me on her own drove me to work harder. I spent a couple of months training at the academy and was top of my class. I passed with flying colors and I eventually graduated from the academy as one of few cadets with high marks. The ceremony had a lot more people than I expected it would. I stood up on the steps of the stage waiting for my name to be called up. I studied the crowd and my face slowly turned into a small frown. I couldn't see my parents. They wouldn't miss my big day. Would they? My thoughts were interrupted by a stern voice, snapping me back to reality. Cadet Henry Thompson of Class 10. A thunderous applause came from the crowd as I walked across the stage as I walked toward one of the captains behind the podium. He handed me my certificate and extended his hand for a handshake. I shook his hand and grabbed my certificate and started walking off the stage. I heard a voice from the crowd that put a smile on my face before I headed off stage. That's my baby! I turned my head and saw my mother jumping up and down, almost falling out of her chair with excitement. And right beside her was my father. After the ceremony, my mother basically rushed over to me and hugged me tightly while congratulating me. Once my mother was finished with hugging the life out of me, my father grabbed me and pulled me to the side. His face had a serious look to it as he looked me dead into my eyes. Henry, listen to me and listen carefully. I want you to know that the job isn't what you expect. It's not normal, trust me. His voice was low and he spoke with a tone I haven't heard him use since I was a child. I would be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit taken aback by his words. W what are you talking about, Pop? I sounded confused and a little disappointed as I thought he didn't believe in me. The atmosphere got a little heavy as he stood there without saying a single word. The silence lasted what seemed like an eternity before he placed his hand on my shoulder. Listen, son, I'll support your decisions you make in life, whatever you choose to do, but heed my warnings. This job isn't what you think it is. It will either make or break you. His tone was serious and his eyes were cold and expressionless. I felt my blood run cold as he started walking away before I could respond to his statement. I cut the celebration short as I felt my body start to feel weird. The drive to my apartment was long and quiet. My thoughts were racing through my mind as I tried to process what my father had told me earlier. After some time, I got inside my apartment took a shower before I started my search for an agency. 
I spent about a few hours searching on my laptop for agencies to work for, but I didn't fit their requirements. I was about to shut my laptop, growing more tired as it was beginning to hit midnight. I reached for the power button for the laptop until a green pop-up ad flashed across my laptop screen. Application for RRA in big, black, bold words. I stared at the pop-up ad for a couple more seconds before I tried to click the X. My heart dropped as my icon started moving on its own and clicked on the pop-up ad. I tried turning my computer off, but it didn't do any good as the pop-up ad took me to a website. A website with a couple of boxes loaded onto my screen with a man holding a badge. RRA, the badge read. Some text popped up on my screen a couple of seconds later. I inspected the website. Looking to be employed as a detective? Well, look no further. Here at RRA, we look for detectives far and wide to help us solve cases with no tests involved. All you have to do is sign up and come to the address after 24 hours and we'll do the rest. As I took a moment to process everything that has happened in the past few minutes, an application form slowly started to appear on my screen. Before I could do anything, my mouse started moving on its own again and started filling out the application form. I tried again to press the power button, but nothing happened. After a while, the mouse stopped and submitted the application. An address appeared on my screen mere seconds later. 609 Night Eye Street. I said to myself, well, that was only 30 minutes away from my apartment. I might as well go there and check it out. If it's a fraud, I'll leave. Morning came quick. I woke up around 6 and turned on the news to see what the weather was going to be today. As I started brushing my teeth, I heard the sound of an emergency broadcast on the TV. The news reporter sat at his table with his papers in his hands. His facial expression shook me as his face had a look of pure terror on it. As I feared, another disappearance happened in the early morning. This has been the seventh disappearance. Sarah Carter, 17, has disappeared from her home. It seems like there was no sign of forced entry. We will be back when we get more information from the police chief. His voice trembling as the broadcast turned to a commercial break. His face, God, the expression on his face, stuck with me. What is happening? How could seven people go missing with such a short time frame with each other? As I got dressed, the sympathy of the families affected wouldn't leave my mind no matter how hard I tried to not think about it. It took me around 30 or so minutes to get ready. I grabbed my coat and headed out of my apartment. The drive to the agency wasn't long as there was little to no traffic today. That was a blessing in itself. I got to the agency and parked my car in one of the parking spaces and started walking toward the entrance of the building. RRA sat on the clear glass door. I pulled the door open and walked up toward the front desk and saw a woman with light red hair and black glasses on her freckle-filled face. She looked like she was in her mid to late twenties, definitely looked a little older than me. Ah, uh, hello there. I filled out the application form on your website and I was hoping I could possibly get an interview, I said while trying to be professional, but I stumbled on my words a little. She looked up from her computer as she looked at me, giving me a warm, welcoming smile. Jessica. My name is Jessica, and of course, right this way. Follow me this way, she said while getting up from behind the desk she was sitting at and started walking toward an elevator. I followed behind her, eventually stepping into the elevator. We went up about four floors, and she led me to an office door. I hope it goes well for you, she said while walking back toward the elevator. Henry, my name is Henry, and thank you, Jessica, I said while giving her a little wave. She gave one back and she stepped back into the elevator, leaving me up there by myself. I took a deep breath before I opened the office door. A man with a black top hat and a black and white polka dot suit sat behind the desk with a small smile on his pale face. 
There was also a slight burly man with long blonde hair tied into a ponytail sitting across from the man in the top hat. Ah, Henry, my boy, have a seat, the man in the top hat said with excitement in his voice, greeting me as if we knew each other for a long time. I took a seat next to the man in the long coat and placed my hands onto the desk, giving the man in the long coat a quick glance before turning my attention back to the man with the top hat. Good morning, sir. I'm glad to be here today with you both. I extended my hand for a shake and waited for him to do the same. No need for that, Henry, my boy. Just call me Sidney, and you already got the job. His voice had so much enthusiasm as he grabbed my hand and gave it a firm shake. I was a little bit skeptical of how easy it was to achieve the job. My face must have caught his attention as he looked with a surprised expression. What's wrong, Henry? You don't want the job? He said, his voice had some disappointment behind it as he waited for my response. No, 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 I stammered. It's not that, sir. It's just that I thought there was more to it, that's all, I said while trying not to make myself sound stupid. Mr. Sidney let out a small chuckle before going into his desk drawer pulling out a black vest and a small badge. The same badge that has the RRA initials on it, but this one was different. This one also had my name on it. Here you go, Henry. This is all you would ever need. Mr. Gordon Truman will be your partner from now on. If you ever need anything, don't be afraid to ask him, Mr. Sidney said while going through a file cabinet and grabbing a somewhat thick file and placing it onto the desk in front of us. This is your very first case. Enjoy, Henry, my boy. And Henry, be careful and listen to your partner at all times. His voice deepened, almost sounding a little demonic. His face quickly turned into the same friendly expression he showed back when I first entered the office. Mr. Truman got up from his seat and headed toward the door, waiting for me to follow him out the door. I followed behind him as he leads me to another office. Welcome to our office, Henry. Don't make yourself too comfortable. We're going to be heading out soon, Mr. Truman said, while taking off his coat and sitting down at his desk while examining the case file. I sat down at my desk and watched as he examined the case files for a couple of minutes. He finally broke the silence as he motioned for me to sit down at his desk. I promptly got up and walked toward his desk, taking a quick glance at the file myself. It was files on all the people that have went missing for the past few weeks. There was even a small file for the recent missing person, Sarah Carter. I'm aware that you've heard of the people that have went missing, he said while taking some of the files out of the folder and placing them in front of me. Yes, Mr. Truman, I've heard of the recent disappearances and it's a shame, honestly. Their families must be devastated by it all, I said while holding my head down in sympathy. It truly is a tragedy having a family member go missing. The longer we take here is the shorter time to find these people. In one piece, that is, Mr. Truman said while standing up, grabbing the files and a pair of car keys. Let's go. The clock is ticking and time is not on our side. He walked over toward the door and I followed behind. As we got out of the building, a bright red Dodge Charger sat there parked next to my somewhat beat up Toyota. My car would be the better option, and I have a little welcoming gift for you. He walked up to the trunk of his car and rummaged through his trunk. He eventually walked up to me and handed me a Smith & Wesson Model 29, a true beauty. I accepted the gift and inspected it as it was in perfect condition. As we got into the car, I decided to take a look over the case files again. Mr. Truman started to drive to a somewhat unfamiliar location for me. Uh, where are we going? I asked with a hint of worry in my voice. Going to the scene of the crime, obviously, he said while gripping the steering wheel a little tighter. It seems like he was a veteran of such as he instantly got straight to the case without procrastinating. How long have you been working at the agency for? I asked trying to make small talk as we were driving a bit far. About 12 years. I've been thinking about hanging it up, though. I just want to take the wife to the beach and spend more time with the kids. You know, he said while breaking contact with the road and gave me a look. Yeah, I know. I know this job will have you away from your family. In 12 years? 
How many cases have you solved? I asked as I was surprised by his response. Too many to count. I've seen countless things people shouldn't know about. A truly disturbing thing, he said as his face was expressionless. My curiosity got the better of me and I asked a question I shouldn't have asked. What was one of the worst cases you were a part of? I asked, hoping to learn a little more about what kind of cases the agency gives to the detectives. A lady, about mid-forties, was complaining she saw eyes watching her from her backyard. Cops didn't believe her, so she called our agency. Me and my former partner were... He paused in his speech. His face showed an expression of distraught. We were too late. We found her a bloody heap on her kitchen floor, being mauled to death by a bunch of small, gray, hellish creatures. My heart was racing like crazy, but my partner had killed them before I could even react to what was going on, he said while keeping his eyes on the road. My eyes widened at his story and felt a chill run down my spine. Hellish creatures? That couldn't be possible, could it? Monsters? There's no such thing. Are you sure that's what you had saw that day? I managed to blurt out my voice as visibly shaken up by what I just heard. Mr. Truman gave a small smile before he spoke his next words. You might as well know what you have gotten into. This job isn't about solving human cases. It's about solving monsters or other worldly creatures. His face lit up a bit as he looked over at me. My heart felt heavy like it weighed down the rest of my body. I felt terror form on my face as I put the pieces together. I had felt the same feeling you're going through right now, not knowing what I had signed up for until I saw firsthand, he said while focused on the road. My mind was racing all over the place. It couldn't be that. Was this what my father was talking about? Before I could come up with any more accusations, the car finally came to a stop outside of a small blue house. Caution tape was everywhere and even a few police officers were still lingering. We're here. If you want a chance to find the missing people alive, then you better pull yourself together and start acting like a detective. You hear? Mr. Truman said while grabbing the case file and getting out of the car. I was still in the car with my mind racing a million miles per hour. But he was right. If I wanted to help find the missing people, I'd have to pull myself together. I got out of the car and followed behind Mr. Truman. A police officer who was guarding the front door of the small house moved aside when Mr. Truman flashed his badge at him. Once we got inside the home, Mr. Truman started walking around observing the crime scene. I headed back to the front door and started observing the locks, even though the report file says there was no forced entry. The culprit had to have gotten in somehow. I inspected the door, but found nothing. No scratch marks, no broken locks. I made my way back to the living room. Henry! I heard a voice call from the other side of the house. I rushed to where the voice came from. Once I got to the room, I saw Mr. Truman on one knee, inspecting something on the ground. A faint trail of blood was emerged into the carpet, and it was leading toward the back door. Mr. Truman followed the trail to the back door where the faint trail ended. So, she was taken out the back door? That's a start, I guess, I said while trying to take a step forward, but Mr. Truman's hand stopped me. Wait, he said while pulling out what looks like a flashlight from out of his coat pocket. He turned it on and started shining it around the back door. As he shined the light on the door frame, I felt my heart drop all the way to my stomach and my knees got weak. Even Mr. Truman was shocked as his eyes widened a little. The door frame and the nearby walls covered with bloody handprints and faint scratch marks. How could this be possible? Why couldn't we see the scratch marks and bloody handprints without the flashlight? I said while I felt my heart beating faster. Mr. Truman regained himself as he stood up and opened the back door before he let out a loud gasp. As I followed out the back door, a shiver ran down my spine as I braced myself against the door frame as my knees were about to give in. 
The backyard had blood splattered all against the fence. A large chunk of the grass was dug up, and dirt covered a part of the backyard. A chunk of the fence was destroyed, and part of the fence was in the forest nearby. The atmosphere felt heavy. I felt my mouth get dry and numb. I couldn't process what was going on. Mr. Truman inspected the backyard with the special flashlight and managed to find more scratch marks and handprints. Henry, pull yourself together. Come take a look at this, Mr. Truman said while standing in front of a half-broken part of the fence. I struggled to stand, but as soon as I could stand, I made my way toward Mr. Truman, avoiding all the blood stains on the ground. Once I got over to him, he shined the flashlight, and what I saw made my heart drop all the way to my stomach. A massive hand mark was on the fence. The claw print was just as big as the hand print. Mr. Truman put the flashlight back into his pocket and pulled out a small notepad and started writing down something. No more leads. This is all the evidence we've got so far, he said while putting the notepad back into his coat pocket. I'm starting to have doubts that the missing people are still alive, I said while taking another look at the yard. I would be lying to you if I told you to keep faith. This is real life, Henry. There's no fairy tale endings to some stories, he said while turning back around and started walking back toward the house. He was right. There was no chance in hell that girl would have survived whatever had attacked her. There was too much blood spilled, and by the looks of it, whatever attacked Sarah was huge. I eventually followed him behind Mr. Truman back into the house and lingered around for a little, making sure we didn't miss anything. All the police already left by this point. If you ask me, I would rather not have let them see what me and Mr. Truman saw. Those poor people. If they are still alive, they must be scared out of their minds. It's still unknown what exactly took them, but it's our job to find out what happened and to put an end to it. As we reviewed the evidence, Mr. Truman's phone started ringing. Once he answered, I slightly heard a voice on the other end. I watched as Mr. Truman's face went from normal to his eyes widening in shock. Before I could ask, he grabbed me and started rushing towards his car. He basically jumped in the car as I got in as well. He jammed his keys into the ignition and pulled off with such force. I almost hit my head on the dashboard. What's going on? I asked while trying not to sound too shaken up, but by the way he was acting, it made me terrified. As he started speeding down the almost empty road, he quickly turned to me with a shaken look on his face. A man called the agency. He said there's banging and loud growling at his back door. It has to be our culprit, he said while turning his attention back to the road. I felt my body sink in as his words hit my body like a truck. I felt the sweat run down my forehead. I didn't want to face whatever was taking people, but I knew if we didn't, it would keep happening. After some time, we pulled up to a mailbox and a little deep into the forest, you can see a house in the distance. Mr. Truman quickly got out of the car and ran toward the trunk and started rummaging around. Henry, hurry up and get down there and make sure the man inside the house is all right. We can't afford to let this man die, he said, still rummaging around. My heart felt weak, but it was no time to chicken out. I pulled the Smith & Wesson from my hip and started running to the house. I would be lying if I said I wasn't scared. I made it to the house and started knocking on the door. Hello, sir. I'm an agent from RRA, and me and my partner were sent to make sure you were safe. I said while leaning against the front door. I heard low-pitched growls and screaming from inside the house and felt my heart stop beating. I quickly snapped out of it and started kicking the door. After the fourth kick, the door fell forward and what I saw scared me to my core. A grayish humanoid creature stood about eight feet tall. Its claws were sharp and big. Its face was split by its sharp razor teeth running down its face. Its legs were long and twisted. Its tail was long and had marks running down it. 
It looked over toward me, but kept walking toward the man who was huddled in the corner, shaking for fear. My arms felt weak as I tried to raise my gun up, but my arms didn't budge. I stood frozen with fear. The creature was about a couple of feet away from the man. The man's screams brought me back. I raised my Smith & Wesson and pulled the trigger. As I shot my weapon, the creature let out a loud, blood-curdling scream as it spun around and locked eyes with me. Its eyes, oh God, its eyes. Its eyes were completely red with hatred for me, causing it pain. Before I could do anything, I pulled the trigger two more times, sending the creature into a screaming frenzy. I tried shooting the creature again, but my gun jammed. It got back up and started running toward me, knocking me into the wall. It felt like I was hit by a freight train. My ribs felt like they were hit with a metal rod as it was harder for me to breathe. The creature managed to slash me with its claw across my back, ripping my coat as I tried rolling out of the way. Its claw was sharp, and I felt something warm run down my back. The creature slowly started moving toward me as I started crawling away, frantically trying to find my Smith & Wesson without breaking eye contact with the creature. It knew it had me where it wanted. It was toying with me. As it was about to pounce on me, a loud boom came from behind the creature, making the creature run past me and through the back door, screaming in pain. It was Mr. Truman, and he had a 12-gauge shotgun in his hands as he ran out the back door in chase of the creature. Um, are you okay, young man? The man said while coming from the corner he was hiding in. Go. Go to our car and wait for us there, sir. It's not safe while that thing is still alive, I said while holding my side. I attempted to get up but fell back down, clenching my ribs. The man walked over toward me and helped me up to my feet. He handed me my Smith & Wesson. I made my way through the back door and quickly looked for Mr. Truman. I heard multiple gunshots and a loud yell not too far away from the house. I started running in the direction where the noise came from. The pain in my ribs was slowing me down, but I kept running. I heard another yell and saw the creature on top of Mr. Truman slashing at him with its large razor-sharp claws. I took aim and once again pulled the trigger. The creature turned its attention from Mr. Truman onto me as once again me and the creature's eyes locked. It started charging at me and I started squeezing the trigger until I heard clicking, but the creature was still standing. It was like it was unfazed by my bullets. The creature was about 10 feet away from me. I tried to reload my weapon and I managed to drop some of the bullets onto the ground. I felt true fear as the creature was only a couple feet from me. My body shook with fear. When I raised my weapon up, it was already in the air and pounced on me. I felt its weight on my body, almost crushing me. It tried to bite me with its sharp teeth, but I managed to grab a stick, and I held the stick to cause space between us. Its breath was rancid, and some of its spit got on my face. I used all my strength keeping it away from me, but it slowly started overpowering me. My ribs went completely numb as I couldn't feel them. Is this how I die? To a creature on my first case? What would my mother do if she had to bury me? My heart was pounding as I started losing my strength. It was going to kill me. An ear-deafening noise rang out from behind me as I felt the creature go limp and fall to the side. I managed to look up and saw an injured Mr. Truman with the 12-gauge shotgun in his left arm. His face had a long gash in it, and he took a step closer to me and extended his hand out to me. Are you all right, Henry? He asked while dropping his gun on the ground. I held my side with my left arm and accepted his help. I think I broke my ribs, but I think I'll live, I said while wiping the blood from my mouth. I took a look at the creature as it laid there in the grass. What do we do with the body? I asked while looking at Mr. Truman, waiting for his response. We don't do anything with it. The police will get rid of it for us, he said while walking back to the car. We managed to get back to the agency, 
Mr. Truman said he would finish the summary part of the case and took it in to Mr. Sidney for me. I checked myself into the hospital for my injuries. I later found out I broke four of my ribs. I was able to leave the hospital a couple hours later. I decided to go home and rest. Once I got home, it was clear that the missing people were no longer here with us. Their bodies were never found, and it still disturbs me even all these years later looking back at my time as an agent for RRA. Nightmares plagued my mind since I first joined the agency. All I could dream about was the monsters I encountered. They still frighten me to this very day, even after all these years later.